How will Dominic Canzone's return from the injured list impact the rest of the Mariners roster? We'll answer that and more coming up here on Mailbag Monday. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Monday, August 5th, 2024. This is Tidy Gonzalez and Colby Patnode for the Locked On Mariners podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On today's show, we're going to open up the mailbag like we do here every Monday and answer some of your Mariners questions. But before we do that, shout out to our title sponsor today. It's Price Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to pricepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use the promo code locked on MLB. That's all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. And if you want to hear from me and Colby even more and help support the show, check out our Patreon. The link is in the description and you can sign up for a free seven day trial. All right, let's get into your questions. We're going to start here with SBR who wants to know with JP Crawford's eventual return and if Victor Robles keeps this up, what are your thoughts about keeping him in the leadoff spot once the captain comes back? Yeah. um, I think, you know, assuming Robles is, anywhere close to what he is right now, he's the leadoff hitter. Um, mm-hmm. it's, Full stop. Yeah. Uh, now, if he falls off a cliff here over the next couple of weeks and, you know, he's really struggling by the time JP comes back, then maybe you consider making a swap there. But then even then, I think probably a Rosarena is, is the leadoff hitter um, in that in that circumstance. So, uh, yeah, I don't think JP is going to see much time in the leadoff spot. He shouldn't, at least when he comes back. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe by the end of the year, he could work his way into that, but he just has not been very good this year. So uh, mm-hmm. overall, he shouldn't be the leadoff hitter, uh, you know, even if he was healthy right now and and he shouldn't be when he comes back. So, yeah, again, unless Robles completely falls off, which is possible, uh, but unless that happens, then I think he's probably the leadoff hitter uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, and if it's not him, I would imagine a Rosarena and Julio are both still ahead of him in, in the pecking order there. Yeah, and if you're going to use JP in the leadoff spot, it should only be against lefties. This year against yeah. righties, 170, 274, 301. That's 70 WRC+. Plus. Against lefties, 284, 357, 455. It's a 135 WRC+. Plus. So JP Crawford, true reverse splits guy uh, this year. Uh, so that's the only situation in which you would be justified in putting him in the leadoff spot. Right. Anything else, you're just hurting yourself right now, at least with the version of JP Crawford we've seen for pretty much all this year. Next question comes from Ham Swaggerty 69. Nice. Who is your fourth outfielder? Gets interesting once Julio gets back. Hanniger has been swinging the bat better, but Canzone, not by much, is better defensively and is a lefty. Does this mean more first base for Luke Rayleigh? Uh, it's tough to say. There's not really a good fit here. Uh, the starting outfield is going to be when Julio is back. It's going to be Julio in center, or Rosarena in left, Robles in right. Like that's just what it's going to be. Uh, now, you might DH a couple, one of those guys a couple times a week or a different guy uh, to get Luke Rayleigh out there who can play all three outfield spots, and Rayleigh can also play first base. So, you know, Turner can DH and, and Rayleigh. So Rayleigh should still get plenty of at-bats, and uh, he's looking better. Uh, you know, still some ugly at-bats in there, but also we know what the upside of Luke Rayleigh is uh, when he's when he's hot. So you're going to keep giving him opportunities somewhere down the line. Uh, Hanager right now is swinging a very good bat uh, since the All-Star break, and we know he he's – managing right-handed pitching very, very well right now. So uh, you want to get him in the lineup as much as you can against righties for the moment. Uh, But you want to do that primarily at DH. So Mm -hmm. you kind of look around here and you go, okay, well, if Rayleigh's the de facto fourth outfielder and you want Hanniger hitting against righties more than you want Canzone, then Hanniger is kind of the fifth outfielder, uh, which would make Canzone the sixth outfielder. And, the problem with that is, is that, you know, Dylan Moore has to play shortstop or has to play shortstop every day. He's an everyday player now, which means now you have to carry an additional infielder in your, uh, on your bench. And that's Rivas. So you can't really send Rivas down mm-hmm. or can zone because you need somebody who could play shortstop and, and second base, particularly while you're trying to see like how Polanco's knee is going to react on a day-to-day basis. So, um, your backup catcher is Garver. So he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, kind of start to look around and you go there's really not a spot on the bench for canzone and do you even want canzone on the bench for a week at a time two weeks at a time uh or do you want him to play 
every day and continue to work on stuff. So uh, the only way I see Canzone making much sense at all is if they actually go with a uh, a shortened bullpen. Uh, we know that they've always carried 13. They carry the maximum number of pitchers they're allowed to. For as long as we can remember, I, I think this might be one of those cases where they just don't do that. They carry seven guys in the bullpen instead of eight simply so that they can get Canzone on the roster because you can't send down Rivas. You can't DFA Garver. Uh, Canzone doesn't help you with the catcher situation. Canzone doesn't play infield. Uh, so you're kind of looking around and you're going, you know, where does Canzone fit if he's, he shouldn't be I mean, It's going to be Marlowe, right? Like that's what's going to happen here is Marlowe's going to get sent down. Uh, they're probably going to wait on on moving off from from Vossler because uh, sure. he, he can play in the infield still. First base, he, third base. Yeah, yeah. But still, like he gives you something other than just corner outfield. Right. Um, right. And then when Julio returns, it's probably the, the corresponding move there is probably Vossler. Right. Um, I, I think Marlowe helps you more off the bench, like in a true bench role than Canzone does because Marlowe can mm. run. He can play some defense. Uh, not something that Canzone is particularly known for. So, uh, yeah, that'll be the move. Uh, it will be uh, Marlowe. Uh, but I do wonder maybe they might go with a shortened bullpen at some point. Here in the next, you know, few weeks, uh, simply because they're going to add another arm on September one, anyways, uh, and they have some off days built in here. So can they kind of, you know, get away with a shortened bullpen for a couple weeks as they try and figure out what to do with, you know, Vossler and Marlowe? We've already seen Vossler; his at bats have basically shrunk to nothing uh, since yeah. the acquisition of uh, Turner. So, yeah, uh, I, I I would have Canzone stay down and play pretty much every day in Tacoma right now and then call him up on September 1 if I wanted to. Um, but, yeah, they'll probably send down Marlowe, but I would watch the bullpen as a possibility here. Mm-hmm. Um, they could go with a shortened bullpen if they want to, but, I mean, doesn't really seem likely just considering what they've always done. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's Vossler, but I, I just figure that it's going to be Marlowe because Marlowe's strictly an outfielder, and Vossler just gives you more options positionally, I would say, so... Sure. It's just, you know, who does who does Dominic Canzone get playtime over right now? Right. Well, not, not Robles, I, not Julio, not uh, yeah, not a Rosa Because because against because against righties, it's already there's already going to be an odd man out between Rayleigh Turner and Hanniger. Right. Once Julio's back, of course. Right. Uh, which could be you know as soon as this weekend, right? So it's not even a a thing that's really that far down the road that it's like, well, we'll just figure it out once we get there. Right. It's like, well, we're, it seems like we might already almost be there. So we'll see. Um, yeah. I just don't know how you're going to get a, get Canzone enough playing time. How you're going to get Rayleigh enough playing time. How are you going to get Hanniger enough playing time while he's hot? And you want to try and extract as much value as you can until that runs out again. Mm hmm. And then obviously you want Justin Turner in the lineup as much as possible. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how they kind of work through it. Uh, it's a good problem to have at the very least. Uh, we are going to answer more of your questions here in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Lockdown Maris podcast is brought to you by Liquid IV. I think most of us can agree that there is nothing better than enjoying an ice cold beverage on a hot summer day at the ballpark. So when you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor, a surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Because baseball and summer go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. Tear Pour, live more. One stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. No more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use the promo code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Tomorrow you can catch all the action between the Mariners and the Detroit Tigers on the Mariners' hometown broadcast of SiriusXM via the SXM app. All you have to do to find that is search the word Mariners. All right, let's get back into your questions here on Mailbag Monday. Mariners Navigator wants to know, 
how many more days is Taylor Saucedo on the active roster? Related, maybe, when is Troy Taylor getting called up? I think Sauce should probably be done now. Um, we've seen mm-hmm. him come in and be used tradition, pretty much like a traditional loogie and epically fail uh, over the last week. Uh, he really didn't pitch the last week up into the All-Star game at all uh, in any situation. I think he appeared once in the last week before the All-Star break. Mm-hmm. Now, since he's come back, he's been frankly garbage. Um, he's been your worst pitcher out of the bullpen. So, uh, you know, I, I know the Mariners really like lefty lefty and all that stuff, but if your lefty is pitching terribly and he's facing the best lefties in the league, it doesn't really matter if it's lefty lefty, he's going to make a mistake. And and we saw that happen yesterday to really essentially end any chance you had of winning that game. Like you didn't have a great shot anyways, but you did have a shot and then Saucedo just ruined any kind of opportunity you had. Um, so yeah, again, kind of like what we talked about with, uh, with Stanek, uh, you know, when, when uh, service kept on going to him, like, yeah, if Scott wants to keep on playing this matchup game and he wants to keep giving the veteran opportunities and it's on Jerry DePoto to not give him that option anymore. Yeah. Uh, Saucedo has options left. You can send him down. Uh, you know, he can certainly come back up in September. There's some things to work on because prior to July, Sauce was pretty good. Uh, so obviously there's still a good pitcher in there somewhere. You're just not getting it right now, and you can't waste these opportunities by going to a guy who's trying to figure it out. So to me, Sauce is is toast, like he should be down uh, in the minors today. Uh, they should make that move today. Uh, and I just – I don't trust him, like, at all. Uh, so – He's the guy I trust the least in that bullpen right now, which is really saying something. And it has been just a, a massive struggle for him. Uh, really, it was a struggle in Boston. It was a struggle against Philly. Uh, and so to me, like he's just not a major league quality guy at the moment. And it's, it's very mediocre stuff. And the command is terrible right now. Control is not even that good either. He had an outing the other night. I think it was in Boston where he threw like 17 pitches and only six of them were strikes. Like he's just not a major league quality yeah. pitcher right now. He, and you don't have time right now. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have time to figure that out. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Send him down. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, Sauce has a, a lot of fans. Uh, he's a fan favorite, of course. And I heard from some of those fans yesterday on Twitter when I said that Sauce should probably be sent down. You know, I heard things like, "Oh, you know, maybe he's going through something mentally." That's all the more reason for you to to send him down to a zero pressure situation in Tacoma and let him get right. right? Because we know what Sauce can be. We know what Sauce has been. And if you can get him back to to where he was, then that's a a legitimate option out of the bullpen moving forward. But I don't know if you're going to be helping him uh, any, especially if he's going through, you know, something mentally, uh, whether or not that's related to his struggles on the field right now. You're not going to be able to help him figure that out uh, by letting him throw against Bryce Harper. Right. So let him him go down to Tacoma for a little while, work on some things, get right. And then, you know, he'll probably get called back up at some point. If, uh, if he's able to get back on track. Next question here from Matthew Johnson. The Mariners almost exclusively use players that were drafted in 2023 to upgrade their roster at the deadline. With that knowledge and also four-fifths of your rotation being drafted, what draft has the, been the best since Scott Hunter has been in charge of them? I think there's like three really good options here. It's hard to go wrong with 2018, though. Logan Gilbert and Cal Raleigh. Yeah. Uh, it's tough to put really any kind of stock in the recent drafts, the last three or four, because none of those guys have made it to the big leagues, right? Like yeah. it's tough to say, oh, they drafted Harry Ford and so and so this year. That's their best one. And it's like, well, those guys aren't big leaguers yet. Uh, so you know, like, which one do I like them? I really like what they did last year. Uh, you know, where they got uh, Emerson and they got. Uh, Pete and they got Farmello. Like that one looks like that's going to be a great draft, but none of those guys are even close to the big leagues yet. So it's kind of tough to pick that draft. So I look at 2019, they go with George Kirby, uh, who leads baseball in F4, pitcher F4 right now. Um, Brandon Williamson, who was a big piece. Uh, was he in the Castillo trade or was he in the, uh, I think he was the Geno trade. Uh, sorry, w- sorry, Williamson, you said? Yeah. Yeah, he was the winker. Yeah, he was on the winker deal. Yeah. They got Isaiah Campbell in the third, who turned in a very good year for them in his one year here. And then you were able to flip him. Levi Stout, who you traded to the Reds as well. Uh, Austin Shenton, uh, who yeah. was in the uh, 
the Diego Digger. Castillo trade. Yeah. He's in the big leagues right now. You know, he drafted Adam Mako, who was kind of an important piece in the uh, Teoscar Hernandez trade. Uh, so yeah, I, Carter Benz also drafted that year. He got you uh, a couple Tyler of years Rand. of Tyler Anderson. Cade Marlowe was a 20th round pick. He uh, got you a couple months. Tyler Anderson. Yeah. You said years. No, oh, sorry. Uh, a couple of months of Tyler Anderson. Uh, so yeah. And then just a fun one to throw in there. It didn't matter because they didn't sign him. Uh, but Christian Ar- Christian Encarnacion Strand was actually drafted by the Mariners that year mm. uh, in the 34th round. Uh, but yeah, to me, it's 2019 uh, just because, again, Kirby, a, you know, borderline ace right now. Uh, and then you got a bunch of guys that either gave you at least a year and some change of value at the big league level, or mm-hmm. you were able to flip for significant impact players like Eugenio Suarez and Luis Castillo. Yeah. Um, Diego Castillo. So, uh, and then you even got a little sweetener at the back end of your, of your draft here. You drafted Travis Kuhn, who's, uh, you know, close to major league ready. You drafted Cade Marlowe, who's giving you a little something, something here, uh, at the, at the, uh, big league level. So I think 2019 is probably the best in terms of like what draft you actually got the most out of probably 2018. Yeah. With, I mean, Logan and Cal, that's, that's tough to beat. Yeah. 100%. All right, we are going to answer a couple more of your questions here in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Locked On Maris podcast is once again brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps on Prize Picks, it's just you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. Prize Picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. And a general rule of thumb here if they breathe air and they're scheduled to pitch against, the Mariners, it's probably a good idea to pick more on their strikeouts. Download the Price Picks app today and use the promo code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's promo code Locked On MLB on Price Picks for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Once again, tomorrow you can catch all the action between the Mariners and the Tigers on the Mariners hometown broadcast with SiriusXM via the SXM app. All you have to do to find that is search the word Mariners. All right, we got a couple more questions to answer here on Mailbag Monday. This one comes from Jeff. Why did they claim Jonathan Hernandez off of waivers? Hernandez is someone that we saw yesterday make his Mariners debut. Of course, former Rangers reliever. Uh, why do you think they like Hernandez, Colby? Slider's pretty good. Uh, it's it's really good whiff rates and on, on the slider. And he's a sinker slider guy. Uh, velocity is, is not a problem with him. He throws very hard. Uh, but I do think that this is mostly about the slider. Uh, he had an option left, so you can kind of you know put him down in AAA. They don't really have a ton of... Uh, quality depth pieces in the bullpen down in triple a right now uh, a lot of the guys that we thought were going to be really good middle uh middle you know innings depth they have all really struggled uh at triple crable ty mm-hmm. buttry no so. longer in the org even yeah uh yeah uh carlos vargas just hasn't figured it yeah. out and and so uh you know you start looking down that list they could use somebody uh and so now he's up in the at the big league level uh but yeah the slider is his his best pitch and I think the Mariners' plan here is probably just to ask him to throw the slider more. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, he, he throws it uh, 49% of the time. So it, it's not like he doesn't throw it a ton. Uh, but we know that the Mariners have no issue asking guys with great sliders to, can he throw it 60% of the time? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so when you look at when you look at Hernandez's slider, uh, this year opponents are hitting 214 off of it with a 357 slug and a 38.8% whiff rate. Uh, meanwhile, the, the sinker opponents are hitting 317 with a 583 slug. So to me, this is just like, hey, let's take a shot. It's a good arm. Uh, average fastball velo, 97 miles an hour. Uh, he gets chases and he gets whiffs, mostly with the slider. Uh, that's a pretty good pitch for him. And he gets a lot of ground balls because he is a sinker slider guy. So even though they're, uh, you know, you know, he does have some exit velo issues. Typically, those balls are on the ground. Uh, he's not giving up a lot of, you know, hard hit line drives and fly balls. So I think this is mostly just about, hey, let's, you know, potential middle guy here. Let's have him throw the slider a little bit more. Let's make our tweak. 
see if it takes. We get you know a couple of weeks here uh, before we have to make a decision on him. And let's see if we can basically add another JT Shark Wah type uh, into the right. middle of our bullpen for free. So I think it's just an interesting arm who has some good metrics on, on a pitch that the Mariners like. And I, I think this is going to be pretty, you know, as simple as like, hey, just throw your slider more. And then we'll see if we can maybe tweak something mechanically so that you have a little bit more command and control over the sinker. Right. You know, and last year, having watched a lot of Rangers games because I was, you know, standings watching, you know, scoreboard watching, uh, I saw quite a lot of Jonathan Hernandez last year, especially late in games for that Rangers bullpen, which was obviously a disaster for the whole year, especially in the second half. Uh, Hernandez is a, one of those guys where it's like some games he can't find the strike zone and it's kind of a disaster and the walks are going to rack up and you know it's probably going to lead to at least a couple of runs being scored and then there's some other games where he's just going to shred through the guys that he ends up facing so Mayor's taking a shot here that the latter is what they're getting and maybe they uh you know they tap into that slider a bit more and really elevate Hernandez Last question of the day comes from John. As a general benchmark, at what point do you look at a prospect and say they are ready for the majors? And how would this evaluation change between evaluating top prospects versus, you know, triple A depth or I guess, you know, lottery tickets is essentially what he's uh, what he's getting at there. Uh, so, yeah, when when do we, I guess, as, as fans or as content creators, you and I, Colby, kind of look at prospects with just the limited data and information that we have right we don't have all the info that of course the organization does to these decisions but uh yeah when for you do you kind of determine like hey this guy deserves a shot there's no you know cookie cutter method here because uh obviously a guy who went to college and you know played for three years at a high level in college typically needs less time than a kid who went to high school and got drafted out of high school. Obviously you're not seeing anywhere close to the same level of competition. And, you know, typically one is 23 years old when they get drafted. One is 18 when they get drafted. So there's a huge age gap there. So there really isn't, you know, a, a unified, you know, theory here. And and plus there are outliers, right? Like Juan Soto might only need 300 plate appearances at 19 years old to prove that he's major league ready. Whereas, you know, Josh Donaldson didn't really break out until he was 29 years old. So, uh, you know, it, it's, there is no, you know, one size fits all here. I, I think when I look at it, um, first thing I'm looking at is like, what type of player are you? Like, what is your, your calling card? Are you a, you know, are you a prep power guy? Like is power your calling card? You probably need more at bats than a, like a really polished, like, you know, 18, 19 year old, uh, high school guy or a really polished, you know, uh, you know, draft eligible sophomore. Uh, so for example, I think Las Montes is going to need more at bats than somebody like Cole Young because Cole Young is closer to a finished product than Montes is. Uh, so it really does depend typically speaking for a high, for a high school prep guy. Uh, I think 1500 plate appearances in the minors is, is a, you know, pretty normal benchmark. That's about three full years uh, of playing time. So when you're a prep guy, if you get to 1500, you'll be about 21. 22, depending on when you, you know, if you actually start that, that summer you get drafted or if they wait a year, but yeah, you'll be 21, 22. By then you probably, although not always, you probably are at least in high A or double A. Uh, so you're starting to face that upper echelon level of uh, pitching. So, uh, you know, for me, that's the other thing too, is like, you have to at least be at double A. And honestly, for me, I would like you to have some triple A seasoning. Some, some guys don't need it. Julio didn't need it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, Kyle Lewis didn't need it. Kyle Raleigh did need it. Uh, Jared mm -hmm. Kelnick did need it. So the Mariners have kind of hit, hit and miss by calling guys straight up from double A. Uh, but, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, I, I do think that bats in particular, triple A is kind of an important step. Uh, but I think you're looking at 1,500 plate appearances, lots of experience. Uh, I think you're looking at success at each level before you get sent up. Uh, and then again, it really depends on what type of hitter are you. Are you a big are you big, you know, home run hitter? Well, then, you know, I, I may be willing to overlook strikeout rate a little bit as long as it's not totally out of control. Whereas if you're Cole Young and you're in, you know, double A and you're racking up a 28% strikeout rate, no, you're not ready. Clearly, you're not ready because that can't be a part of your game. Remember, triple A is significantly harder than double A and the majors is a whole other animal on its own. So, right. 
yeah, there's no like basis here uh, for comparison. I, I think you're just looking at, you just kind of have to know. It's kind of a gut feel thing. And you look at it, you say, when was this guy drafted? What was his upside? What was his original ETA? What is he doing now at the minor league level? And it all kind of goes into this decision of like, do I think he's ready? Probably. Uh, so, or probably not. So I, I do think a general baseline for me is that you're drafted out of high school, you're prep, 1,500 plate appearances in the minors, mm-hmm. preferably a decent chunk of those coming, you know, against double A or better mm-hmm. uh, before I would consider calling you up. But there are outliers uh, to, to that rule. So mm-hmm. uh, you just have to watch and, and you know, you watch the player, you, you read about the player, you listen to the player. You could tell a lot of the times when somebody is just, they're too good. They're too good for right. this level. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's really obvious. Most of the yeah. time, it's really obvious. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you just got to be a little bit patient. Yeah. And with pitchers, it really just comes down to stuff and command control. Command control. Yeah. Yeah. If you have at least one plus offering, I'm like, okay. Yeah. You like, you it's probably shot. time. To, yeah. It's probably time to at least take a shot on you. Right. Assuming there's an opening and all that stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, the prep. Because you're drafting college guys, because you're drafting high school guys, because you're signing 16 year olds, uh, the timelines fluctuate greatly. So, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes Ronald Acuna Jr. can come up at 19 and just tear, you know, tear baseball a new one. And, and sometimes Mike Trout can come up at 20 and, and have to go back to AAA because he just struggled so bad. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's outliers every, well, probably not every year, but there's outliers everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the important thing is, is that you can't overreact. You can't look at this and say, well, Colt Emerson is going to be an outlier. Laz Montes is going to be an outlier. Based on what? Based on, you know, for Emerson, 150 plate appearances at, at A-ball? No, that, that's not a thing. Uh, and by the way, we've seen Laz Montes go up and everybody was like, so sure he might, you know, he might be challenging for an opening day roster spot next year, which is ridiculous always. Um, and now he struggled at Everett which is good. There, there's nothing wrong with a guy going up and struggling. That's part of development. Mm-hmm. So like nobody should be concerned about Laz Montes because he hasn't performed right away at a ball or at high a ball. Right. These things take adjustment times. And sometimes, you know, you, you, you'd rather be, you'd rather be like a couple months late on a guy calling him up than a couple months too early. Uh, because a couple months too early can shatter somebody's confidence a couple months too late. I mean, all you really did there is you missed out on a couple months of a guy who could have been helping you. And you'll uh, never so. know, really. No, no, you won't. Uh, but oftentimes, like the things like, oh, they called him up too early and ruined his career. Not really a thing. Not as much as some people make it no. out to be. Uh, but you absolutely can stunt the, the growth and development of a player by calling him up and having him sit for weeks yeah. at a time. By, you know, keeping him up at the big leagues when he's clearly overmatched. Uh, and, and mm-hmm. you just kind of refuse to send him down. And the Mariners have made those mistakes in the past. Uh, haven't seen a ton of that with Jerry uh, in, in Justin's regime. Uh, you could argue maybe they did that with Kelnick. Based on what Kelnick's done in, in Atlanta this year, I'd say that just kind of looks like who Jerry Kelnick's going to be. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty good at, at this. And obviously the drafting developing, they're very good. They're also pretty darn good at knowing when it's time, when somebody needs a look and, and when they don't. Uh, for the most part, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good at it. And that's part of development is knowing when it's time to challenge somebody uh, with the next step. And by the way, Michael Arroyo uh, looks like he might be ready for double A uh, because he is way too good for high average. And, and that guy's 19 years old. So, uh, or 20, but uh, yeah, there, there's no like one formula for me, 15 at 1500 at bats for a prep guy or plate appearances. Yeah. 700 to a thousand for uh for a college guy uh unless there's insane defensive value there uh those are just general guidelines and then i'd like to see them have success at least at double a if you're a hitter if you're a pitcher i'm just looking for stuff and command really yeah yeah uh michael arroyo is still 19 by the way and he won't turn 20 until november 3rd and uh yeah. for those of you wondering it, he's slashing 264 396 479 148 WRC plus down in Everett. All right. 
that is going to do it for our show. But before we get out of here, a reminder that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. For Colby Patnode, I'm Ty Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Ty Gonzalez, Colby at CPAT11 at CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Now head on over to Locked On Seahawks to get all the latest out of training camp from Corbin Smith and the gang and tell them Ty and Colby sent you. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day. We'll see you next time. Peace.